Okay. So let's start with your first name and your age and where you're from. Okay, well, my name is King. I'm 20 years old and I'm from Albany, Georgia. Okay, and what do you prefer, King or Lakeet? Um, whatever's good for you. My full first name is King Lakeet, but uh, people oh. call me whichever one. So. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so how did you figure out what you wanted to do? Because you're, you're still young and mm -hmm. a lot of people don't even figure out their purpose and they're like 30, 50. How did you figure it out? Right. Well, um, when I was younger, uh, I've known my purpose ever since I was a kid, since I was about two years old. And um, uh, one of the ministers I listen to, he always says that a child is going to tell you their purpose either with their mouth or through actions. And it's up to the parent to cultivate you know, that purpose for them. And a lot of people aren't blessed to have parents or somebody in their life to help them cultivate their purpose. So that's why we have so many people with their gifts and purposes, you know, in the graves with them. Um, but I was blessed to be able to have my grandmother at the time. And I've known my purpose ever since I was about two years old. And um, I remember this vividly. And usually when you're growing up, you don't remember a lot of things that happened when you were young unless it was like something super important or it was a big event and I remember this conversation vividly I was still in the car seat and um, I was talking to my grandmother and I asked her um, did she know how it was to have butterflies in her stomach like she felt like something was about to happen and she was like yeah and I told her I was here to finish what Dr. King started and um, at the time she was kind of uh, you know taken aback because she was like, you know, what, what do you know about Dr. King? You know, you have no clue, you know, as to what none of that had, you know, you don't know what that's going, what's yeah. going on with that or anything. And um, I remember telling her that vividly. I remember the street we was riding on, the, the stop sign we stopped at, all of that. I remember the, the entire conversation. Wow. Yes, I was too. Yep. And so um, as time went by, uh, I started rejecting it because I was telling her, I was like, oh, I was, you know, I was little. We probably watched a Dr. King video or something like that at school, maybe. And she was like, no, I don't care, you know, what you're trying to do. You know, um, you're here to finish what Dr. King started. And I'm just like, okay, whatever, you know, and we argue about it. And me and my grandmother have had big arguments about this. Like we've had almost getting ready to put me out the house type arguments over this purpose. Um, and like as school went by, um, I was doing a lot of things. Uh, I did culinary school. Um, I graduated a degree in there. I um, went to the military, all of that stuff. And all the while, my grandmother was like, I don't care what you call yourself doing. You know what your purpose is, you know. And so grandma <laughs> how, yeah, grandma <laughs> knew. So as I finally I gave in and I started researching Dr. King and who he was and, and what he was doing and and why he did the things that he did. I pulled all his FBI files, I got all the books, everything, because I really want to know what was this man about to start? You know, well, what did he start that I'm supposed to be finishing? Or what didn't he finish? Um, so I finally, you know, started researching and my purpose became more clear. And so um, I returned back to Albany. I was living in Atlanta at the time, but I returned back to Albany when I was about 19 years old. And I was going and speaking at different places and in different community events. and. I was having issues. I was having issues because um, um, adults, I'll say adults, I'm an adult too, but like older people in the older generation, they don't want to really put in any work to fix the community. And a lot of them have their old same mindsets and they don't want to you know, change anything that they have going on to get out of the condition that they're in. And so I was having issues working with the adults and people wanted me to come speak places, but nobody wanted to actually do the work I was talking about doing. And so one day I was like, man, what if Dr. King had like a, a clan of 20 kids that he would teach, you know, and, you know, they could ride along with him. Or what if Malcolm X had like 20 kids that, you know, he was teaching all while he was, you know, going around doing speeches and things like that. So they, they could kill Malcolm, but they couldn't really kill Malcolm because he taught, you know, 20 other kids. So right now um, what I've been doing is I've been strictly working with young boys. Um, and I've been teaching them things, you know, uh, such as the skilled trades, uh, how to change brakes, oil, uh, fixing cars, uh, remodeling homes, painting, all of those things in hopes of teaching them how to make their own money for themselves, start their own businesses, and maybe use that money to go fund their dream. Um, so I always tell them, you know, you don't have to just make money just from your dream. You know, of course you want to make money doing what you want to do, but some things you're going to have to do, you know, just to to pick you up. You know, you may have to work a nine to five for a year or two to pick yourself up and get your money together to fund your dream. So I try to teach them those things to make sure that they 
are, uh, you know, well able to take care of themselves and their families. And so with that being said, as I'm teaching them these things, as they get older, they are, they are asking more questions. They're asking deeper questions. They're asking more yeah. important questions. And so this is developing different mindsets because you have to catch a child while he's young and teach them and they'll never depart versus you trying to teach in the 30 year old or a 29 year old on um, the way to go. And they already have their mindsets made up. So it's, it's better teaching children because they're like sponges. And I feel like a lot of our civil rights leaders make mistakes by not teaching the babies. Mm -hmm. And what is your program called for the people watching? It's called the X for boys. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to have your contact link under anyway. Okay. Yeah. Um, I agree. And what you said about being two, I believe it because, you know, kids, they have a higher spiritual connection mm -hmm. already. Yep. So, oh, you actually went into my next question, which was what kinds of hardships did you face mm -hmm. wanting to shift the community right. with adults or anybody? Okay. And that was, um, I, when I was saying that, I was like, I think I'm going into the next question. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so basically, um, it's just been trying to, um, well, at the time I was trying to get the adults um, into it and actually getting them to actually want to do the work and also you know in the black community we have this issue with competition and people think you're trying to go against them and it's, it's just a lot you know that we have to deal with which is why i don't work with adults so much um i do work with them sometimes when you know we have different community events but my sole purpose in working is with the children and so in 10 to 15 years you'll see you know the boys that I teach grow older and go you know be doctors and lawyers and things like that but they'll have all different mindsets versus the generation you know now and we're teaching the kids the same things over and over again but expecting the cycle to change it's not going to work um so but yeah hardships um right now I need a building, you know, for my boys because I actually have them living with me for this summer. Um, I have six kids um, living at my house. Um, they've been living with me um, since June. Yeah, beginning of June. They've been living with me. And uh, we go places. We've been going on trips. Uh, we've been doing oh. workshops. We have different jobs we've been doing. So they've been getting paid, you know, and it's, it's been great for them. And they're getting a different experience because they're able to see somebody that's still close to their age. I, I'm 20 years old. I turned 21 July 26. And um, I'm young like them. They're age 14 to 17. They're easy to listen. And they see the things that I have. I have my own house and cars and, and land. And they're like, okay, I want to be somewhat like this when I turn 20. I'm like, well, I want you to be greater than me when you turn 20 because I'm giving you the keys at 14. So now when you turn 20, you should be two to three times greater than I am. I just want to make sure that I'm learning more things um, to better them. So as I'm getting older, I'm, te I'm learning more things. I'm learning how to do different things so I can keep teaching um, the younger kids because the problems, you know, that I'm having with them is, um, you know, the, the parenting, um, it's, that's a big issue. Um, and also the, the literacy rates, those, that's a big hardship. Mm -hmm. Um, like last year I had a group of children. Um, I had about 20 kids last year in my summer camp. They were at my house too, but they didn't stay last year, um, because I had so many, but, um, last year I had maybe about a six of them that could really just flu fluently read out of 20 of them. What? And, and yeah. And, and that, no, when I'm telling you, I'm serious. And one of my kids, he's like sixth grade, couldn't read at all. Like I, I was surprised he even made it to the sixth grade. And I'm like, are we serious? You know, our kids really can't read. And, and I'm saying, you know, I can't, I can't necessarily blame the parents all the way, you know, but I also blame the schooling too, because I'm just like, how are we passing them through school? And this, this child can't read how he can't even read the questions, you know, to all of these answers, you know, and the answers to the questions and none of that. He can't even pass it. I know he can't pass the test because he can barely write. He's in the sixth grade. He can't write or read. I'm like, how he get all the way to the sixth grade? What are we doing? You know? So yeah. it's, it's, it's just a lot, you know, that a lot of problems dealing with the youth. And so this is why I want to start a school and things like that. It's a lot of problems, you know, I could go on and on. <laughs> oh, gosh. Wow. I didn't, oh, they stay at your house. That is so cool. Yeah, they stay with me. <laughs> like you have a whole bunch of brothers, little like yep. little brothers. Um, so is this all you or do you have a team behind you? So right now I just started. So I'm, on, I'm going to my second year of the X for Boys. What I am doing, I do have some people that come help, you know, here and there, such as with food and water and things like that. But as far as the overall program, <clears throat> I'm, I'm breeding the team. 
I'm creating the team. So some of my kids who are older, such as 17, 16, 17, 18 year olds, um, in the next two or three years, when the school starts and the, the, the program starts at a different building, I'll actually assign them their own group of kids at the buildings and things like that, because they'll be able to teach what I taught them. And so I won't have to, you know, train any other people on how to, you know, teach because I already taught my boys how to do it. And all I do is supervise and monitor what they're teaching the kids. And also I'll kind of make it like a competition thing. So like three of my boys that I'm teaching right now, next year they'll have their own groups. And so what I'll do is whoever's teaching, you know, obviously we'll see who's teaching their children the best or whatever. So we'll have a competition who can put uh, the toilet on the fastest or who can put up the ceiling fan the fastest, you know, things like that, who learned the most you know during camp try to make it fun for them too but I also want them to get a teaching experience too because once you're you're 17 and 18 I've been teaching a group of kids I'm, I'm gonna be a good father or whatever I've you know been helping to raise you know so many kids and I'll just be monitoring them and um, learning new things myself and promoting the program and making sure other kids you know are able to get in um, and my big thing is I want them to get in for free um, so I'm trying to get funding for the program, um, government funding. I'm trying to get the, the city, uh, the city to uh, get the, the program. So, yeah, this is Baby King. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, so I'm just trying to get the city to fund the program as well. So I just want kids to be able to come for free because it costs for me to. And I try to make sure the program is as affordable as possible, you know, for parents. Um, but also it comes with a big kick for me, too. So I have to make sure that I'm you know, financially stable um, to be able to take care of some of those things I can't ask the parents for and they, the things that they're not able to to take care of themselves. So, yeah. Um, yeah. That's so good. I would have loved, even as a girl, a little girl growing up, I would have loved something like that. Mm -hmm. wow. the, only, the only reason, um, I know a lot of people ask why I only do boys. For one, I do believe that boys um, are... I know people call it a patriarchy type thing or whatever. That's a whole nother conversation. But I do firmly believe that women follow, you know, the, a man's example um, and we lead. And so I feel like if I'm teaching the children, you know, um, with the boys where to go and how to, you know, conduct themselves, um, women will raise their standards for the men and men will raise their standards for girls. And so they'll ultimately teach the women and they'll go in the way they should go. Um, but also I have um, a friend of mine, her name is Miss Carla Hawkins. She has this camp called Queens Camp, Queens R Us. And um, I don't, she's not doing it uh, this year, but um, last year it was called Queens R Us. And she taught, you know, girls like uh, all of the, the woman things. Like she taught them how to, you know, all the elegant stuff, how to sit, you know, how to, you know, wear a dress this way, all, all of that stuff that women needed to know. You know, she was teaching little girls. And so I do the opposite, you know, with the boys. And plus um, right now in this climate, you know, I don't want um, – any of the me too things and none of that stuff mm -hmm. I, people send people try to try and you know uh, sabotage you and things like that and so i just have to you know be on my p's and q's with that and i don't you know want any little girl saying something happened with another boy or anything it's like or anything like that so i just try to stay clear of that and just keep it all boys yeah i understand mm -hmm. what so what are your top three most moving or emotional moments with mm -hmm. your boys okay so the first one um i'd say last year's graduation that i had with the boys um i taught the boys last year how to make an omelet uh in my kitchen i taught them all how to make an omelet they all got in the line and they all i taught them how to do it first and everybody you know came to the stove and i taught them how to to do the omelet and so, um, of course, all the kids were excited to learn how to, oh, I know how to do an omelet now. So they went home trying to make their families omelets and things like that. And the parents were posting the pictures on Facebook, you know, saying they didn't burn down the kitchen <laughs> and things <laughs> like that. But um, one of my boys' mom, you know, she was all, she almost got in tears uh, at the graduation just simply because of that one thing. She was just like, to see my son, you know, go and make an omelet. <laughs> she was just, she, she was moved to almost tears and it almost made me cry too. Oh, really? And, uh, you yeah. have a graduation ceremony after the camp? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Oh, my I do. gosh. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, my gosh. I'm almost getting emotional because that's... <laughs> I, yeah, know so, what, I know what that can do for kids. Right, and it gives them... I give them certificates for everything they learn how to do during the summer. Um, like this summer, everything that they've learned, they'll get certificates for. And this also counts as experience for them, too. So they'll be able to put me down as a reference and also, you know, the work that they did with the business because the Expo Boys is a business, that uh, Expo Boys LLC, so they can always, you know, write us down, you know, as a reference. 
And um, I'm not even in the camp. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I just this is to me, this is just needed. It's it's just needed. And um, even with the certificates and things like that, the reason I wanted to start the school, sorry, jumping off topic. But the reason I wanted to start the school is because when they get to my school, they'll be able to learn all of these skill trades super early because I plan on doing sixth through 12th grade. Mm -hmm. And so they'll be able to learn these skills like really, really early. And um, they'll learn how to do forklifts. I know how to drive a forklift too. So they'll do forklift and heavy machinery, um, farming, uh, painting, you know, you name it. And uh, fixing cars, all of that stuff. And I'll have it set up where people can actually, they can get paid to actually fix on people's cars and get people's um, houses, you know, to paint for projects and things like that. And so when they graduate high school, they'll be able to say, well, I have six, six years of experience painting houses. I have six years of experience welding. I have six years of experience driving for mm-hmm. Well, how are you 18 years old with six years of experience? I'm like, well, I went to this school called the Life Preparatory School for Boys, and they taught us all of this stuff, you know, mm-hmm. growing up. Um, so I know how to do everything, you know, that I can possibly, you know, get my hands on. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people ask me all the time, well, King, how are you 20 years old? You know how to do all this stuff. I'm like, for one, I utilize YouTube. And YouTube is one of the biggest things i tell my boys all the time like y'all y'all guys be on social media all day like you can get on youtube and learn how to make you some money Mm -hmm. i'm like i learned how to paint houses on youtube i learned how to uh fix cars off of youtube i learned how to cut hair off of youtube i learned how to do everything off of youtube and so after that it's just honing your skills it's just honing your skills so but yeah so but yeah back to the um the the big moment so that's the graduation moment um and last year my boys we were watching a video of minister farrakhan and he just spoke uh, two days ago, but we were watching an old video of him and they were asking, you know, um, how old he was. And I was like, well, Mr. Farrakhan's probably about 86. He was 86 at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, he's probably about 86. And they were like, well, Mr. King, what are we supposed to do, you know, when he dies or whatever? And I'm just like, well, you know, we just got to keep the message going. You know, I'm just like, he's telling you, he's giving you the message, you know, now. So you just got to keep, you know giving it to the next generation it was like well mr king that's gonna be you and we're gonna protect you when we get older because you're gonna keep teaching us all of this stuff and you know you're gonna keep making sure that we are gonna be good men so we're gonna protect you and that's gonna be you're gonna be just like minister farrakhan and at the time of course i try not to get like super emotional in front of them but that was a big you know thing for me for 11 year old to say that you know i was like you know <laughs> wow mm-hmm. and my last moment um I did a march back in January uh, 2020. I did the I Am A Man mm-hmm. march. I rebirthed the march that Dr. King did, what well, was about to do um, in Memphis before he was killed. And so at that march, I met a lot, a lot of young boys. Um, they were, you know, really happy to meet me and things like that. And um, a guy drew a portrait of me. Um, he did a art, uh, he drew a painting of me. And uh, he did two, he did two paintings of me and uh, to see people, you know, wanting to buy the paintings kind of got me. But um, one picture of one of the boys that met me while, while I was there, um, his mom, he wanted a picture of me. His mom ordered a, um, a painting of me. And so he has a painting of me on his wall um, because he wants to be just like me when he grows up. Oh my God. <laughs> and she, yeah. And she sent me a picture of it and it's stuff like that just makes me smile really hard and make me feel super special <laughs> that's validation that what you're doing is important and right. it's your purpose so that is wow I, okay um, <laughs> um what do you think what else does albany need as far as organizations mm-hmm. businesses recreation etc in addition to your ex you're the ex for boys well, I think um, right now, um, I've said many times that Albany, of course, we are a majority black city. And a lot of people who come um, through here are surprised because that's that's a rarity. Um, a lot of cities are majority white. and But we're like 70, between 74 and 77 percent black. Yet we don't have a lot of things to show for it besides churches and funeral homes. And I always say that, you know, there's no reason that Albany has doesn't have any skyscrapers. There's no reason that downtown isn't you know, flourishing. There is no reason that our city isn't flourishing as it could be, you know, but is it, because we should be taking, you know, the reins and taking over our city and, you know, buying the buildings and opening businesses and supporting each other, you know, for the main part. And so for Dr. King to come here and this was the only city he failed in, 
you know, um, that, that speaks volumes. And so that's a, a big reason I'm teaching the boys, you know, how to buy property and real estate and things like that, because I always tell them, you know, you want to come back and give to your community. You don't want to take your, you know, leave your community the way it is, because that would be being selfish because you knew how you grew up. So why would you want another child to grow up in that same condition? So I'm teaching them to know you go, go buy, you know, the businesses, go buy buildings, you know, create things for your community. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like as far as recreation and things like that, we, we should, um, mainly open our children up to more than just football and basketball and maybe baseball. Um, I feel like we should open it up to all sports because I was researching yes. um, last year. The reason I started my bowling team with the boys is because uh, we don't have like a lot of black participants in, in a lot of quote unquote white sports um, and bowling. We've, there have only been two winners of the PBA uh, national championship only two black bowlers, but I'm like, every sport we get in, we take over. So why not, you know, put some kids in bowling, they make money, you know, and things like that. And they may like it, you know, it doesn't take a lot of effort. Um, and then also I was looking at professional on um, table tennis, they make $140,000 a year on average. I was like, I need to be playing ping pong, you know, so, <laughs> you know but it's small things like that. And, and it's so many Olympic sports that we don't participate in mm -hmm. at all. Like, you can go to the Olympics and we don't have any, you know, teams there. It's like maybe the African teams, but I'm like, we should, you know, have black children doing other things besides football and basketball because they're not guaranteed to make it to NFL or NBA. But if you go to a, you know, a pool where it's not a lot of people, you're more likely to get, you know, picked versus you're trying to get picked out of millions of black children that want to play basketball and millions of black children that want to play football, but it's only maybe a few hundred people uh in the nba and the nfl you know so you have a better chance of being struck by lightning than making it and that's the actual fact you know so i'm just like we should put our kids into other sports you know so that's why i started the bowling team because i want them to get into something else and i want to start other teams so when the school starts we have teams for everything we have ping pong teams bowling teams golfing you name it you know we'll try to do all of the different sports like i don't want any like regular sports besides maybe basketball and baseball and i don't believe in football even though i played all my life i don't believe that children need to be playing football <laughs> but um because of the contact and the concussions and all that stuff i had a few of them and you know i still have trouble with that sometimes so i don't want i don't believe in football it's too barbaric in my opinion but um yeah i just think we should you know put our children into other sports um and I think we just should just keep going into, you know, the, with the flow of things right now, because we are in a revolution right now and I'm watching us start our businesses and support each other and things like that. So if we keep going, you know, in this way, we could bring that right here to Albany and just support each other, honestly, and, you know, help pool our money together, start businesses, open up our own gas stations, banks, you know, you name it or whatever, and not, and just make it happen. Um, that's what I think. Um, so we could we could use a few more things here in Albany as far as businesses and uh, things to start and helping our children. Just want to make sure that, you know, we're focused on the issues inside the community, not just the ones outside the community. Yeah, I agree. I was interested in archery and because I think oh, yeah. it's so cool. Like I love mm -hmm. the bow and arrow, but mm -hmm. we didn't ever have anything and volleyball, too. I Right. I definitely would have played at Westover if we had mm -hmm. volleyball. <laughs> yeah, we just need to, you know, expand our range with sports because it's scholarships for all of that stuff. And even playing video games, I'm telling my boys, I'm like, y'all playing video games all day. Mm -hmm. There's children out here getting paid to play video games. If you want to play video games, go get paid to do it. You know, you can get scholarships for playing video games. I'm just like, you can go out here and as long as you got the right resources, you can make that happen. So while they're with me, I'm, you know, creating, you know, friendships for them all over the world as well. So it's people following the extra boys from Australia, England, um, Japan. It's people following us from everywhere. And so I'm keeping contact with these people. So whenever you may need to go to Australia one day, I got a contact for you over there. You need to go over there and take care of some business. Let me hit my friend that's in Australia to make sure you can eat and you got somewhere to stay when you get there. You know, so it's also creating, you know, friendships and um, pathways for them everywhere. Um, so when they, like I said, when they leave the Expo Boys, a lot of the stuff they don't understand now, but as they get older, they're going to be like so super appreciative, you know, a, a lot of things that, you know, we're doing for them. Um, I just want to make sure that they're, you know, set up to work for their grandkids. And I tell them that all the time. You want to make sure you're doing things for your grandkids because a lot of times we'll say that white people got white privilege. But it's not necessarily that. 
It's just their parents thought about them before they were, you know, their grandparents yeah. thought about them before they were thought of, you know, it's so generational I, wealth. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, and we can do the same thing. You know, we can do the same thing. Nobody's stopping us from doing that. So I just want to make sure that they're thinking about these things ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I just, I don't understand. Everything we get new is a new restaurant. Like, mm-hmm. like. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then we're wondering why, you know, we're dying of these different diseases and things like that. It's, yeah, all we get is restaurants in Albany. I'm just like, we got enough food. Mm-hmm. We need stuff to do, you know, fun to have, get these boys into actually doing something other than, you know, sitting at home all day because I'm thinking about pushing the summer program um, to a, almost a year-round thing because of COVID because people, you know, they have their children sitting at home, you know, and even though I only have six kids, it's not a lot, but it's something, you know, taking those kids from out the streets and smoking and things like that, they're able to come and get actual lessons about life and learn different things and, you know, grow themselves. So that's, that's the biggest thing. Hmm. Have you ever thought about adding a YouTube channel? yes Mm -hmm. so that's coming soon um so what i'm gonna yeah (laughs) so what i'm gonna do is um the things that i'm teaching the boys such as changing braids oil and things like that we're actually gonna do videos instructional videos on how to do those things for other kids you know so i have the boys you know it'll be all of them you know so one person will tell you for step number one they'll tell you what you need to do it uh, you know, step number two, step number three, you know, and we'll, I'll make the videos for them. Um, and I also have some kids that, you know, are interested in graphic design and I've been learning how to, you know, make my own show and things like that. Mm-hmm. So I've been teaching them how to use the computer and um, how to, you know, make graphics. So they'll make the video. We'll put them on YouTube and, you know, we'll keep it moving. Wow. Just going up. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, um, so on your Instagram in the video, I saw you said something along the lines of you can't say you care about your community unless you're involved in it. Mm-hmm. And I I agree. And so, but what are some things that residents who may not be as vocal and outgoing as you can mm-hmm. still do to help? Um, one of my biggest things, and I think I remember which video that was, I think I was on a radio show and I was talking about um, fatherhood and how um, as a man, you know, you, you're you not a real father, quote unquote, um, unless you're involved in the community where your child will be growing up. Um, because it, he's not just going to be in my home. He's going to be at school. He's going to be at the park. He's going to be downtown. So if I'm, you know, in the affairs of the community where my child will be growing up, I have to make sure every area he's growing up in, you know, will be, you know, somewhere he should be. Um, so aside from that, um, I definitely feel like, um, everybody can play a part simply by doing something super small. And I always say that every, you know, man, every black man in particular should be responsible for at least one child that's not his um, because 41 percent of black men um, are without child. Um, And that's a big number. So I feel like if a lot of those men were to take, you know, some children under their wing, especially a lot of them who don't have any fathers at all, you know, a lot could change and a lot could happen. Um, and also, you know, it doesn't have to be anything big. I tell people all the time, it's, it could be something as small as finding one family to feed, you know, per week, you know, um, making somebody smile, go give that homeless person a dollar that you never give a dollar, you know, just help somebody out, make somebody smile, you know, you don't know where that small amount of energy, you know, could send, you know, uh, that person to, like, even when I used to do this uh, black men's discussion, I used to have um, every Thursday last year, um, you know, some guys would just come from work, you know, they'd be, you know, just tired and ready to go home, but they come there and talk and get a little energy and go home. And you don't know what they was doing for their wives or their children, because you sent them home happy. They've been able to talk and wind down. They can go home and get a wife hug and things like that instead of coming home tired and just like, Oh baby, leave me alone. I want to go to bed, you know, type stuff like that. So you don't know where that little small amount of energy, you know, could, could change and, you know, affect multiple people's day, even speaking to people, you know, in the store, I speak to everybody I see and give them a smile, you know, Hey, how you doing? You know, whatever. You don't know what that small thing, you know, could, do um for that person so i just feel like everybody could play a part simply by just doing the smallest thing that you can even if you can't do anything big you know make somebody smile do something for somebody you know teach somebody something um just try to make somebody else's you know condition greater um and we all could do that you know we all could find something to do yeah i agree 
because I'm a shy person. Mm -hmm. I probably, I didn't talk that much in high school. Never did, middle middle school included. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But this is my little way of giving giving back to our community. Mm -hmm. So thank you for being on here. (laughs) Yes, ma'am, absolutely. (laughs) Um, So next question. So what does the Albany community you're striving for look like? Mm -hmm. Okay, so for right now, I definitely see crime and recidivism um, down um, and far down because all of our boys and and youth and girls have things to do. They have money that needs to be made. They have their own businesses. They're taking care of their families. They're able to fend for themselves. They're not you know, necessarily relying on government assistance or anything like that. They are doing, um, you know, for each other, um, group economics, working with each other, teaching each other's children, um, group homeschooling, all of that stuff. Um, I definitely feel like all of these things, you know, um, make a community. And a community, the root word is unity. And so I feel like all of us making sure we work together um, and making sure things happen. um, Because I feel like a lot of the boys, you know, committing crime and things like that, um, they just need some uh, a place to go and they need somebody to guide them. And I feel like if the community was unified, you know, we could have someone down the street, you know, helping, you know, that child out so they won't be doing anything. You know, like I had a child uh, last year come from juvenile court. They sent him to my program. He had to wear an ankle brace while he was there, you know, the little ankle monitor thing. He had to wear that. And as he was there, I never had any problems out of him, but he just needed somebody to talk to, you know, and somebody to be there for him. He was 13 years old. He had stole, a, uh, stole his grandma's car or something like that. But as I talked to him, he was saying, you know, he was like, well, he was like, I don't get to eat when I go home. He was like, my grandma don't like to see me eat. And um, and he was like, I so I have to sneak in. The only reason I come home late is because I have to sneak and eat food. You know, he, she can't see me eat. So I used to send him home with food in his backpack and things like that because we don't be we don't know what's going on at home with these children. A lot of people will see them commit the crime, but nobody's asking why. Like why why did you do that? What's going on with you? You know, even rapists, murderers, serial killers, all of that stuff. We we'll, you know, attack them, but I like no. What's what? Why would you do that? What's what's going on? You know, did anything happen to you? You know, and things like that that made you turn into that person. You know, so I you know talked to him and I tried to get down to the root, and he's doing fine now. You know, he just needed somebody to talk to him. He needed somebody to be there for him. He needed somebody to teach him something. You know, he was saying he likes to um, hack stuff. He like he want to be like a hacker. So I was like, man, you can get on YouTube. You can learn how to hack phones or whatever, or unlock phones. You can go make go put up a Facebook Marketplace ad and be like, hey, look, I'm unlocking phones for thirty dollars. Boom, some money right there. And then you can go to school for for uh, cyber intelligence or whatever. I'm just like anything. I'm like, it's the ways to make money with everything. You just gotta want to get out there and do it. You know, so it's just giving them the drive and giving them, giving them the thought process to even want to go do that stuff. Um, that's super important um, for me. It's just giving them the drive, giving them the drive. They got to have the drive. Right. A lot, I know a lot of people can be misunderstood like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, how long do you think it'll take for Albany to get to that place? Um, well, my particular vision, um, I think... Um, as time goes by, it's not going to be an overnight thing. I probably won't see a full replica of this vision until I'm maybe about 40, 45, 50. And the reason I say that is because the children that I'm teaching and my children that I'm going to have and things like that, they're going to have to get older and put these things in place. You know, I'm raising mayors and senators and, um, you know, congressmen, lawyers, doctors, welders, you know, I'm raising all of them. You know right now so of course they have to take time to get into their careers and you know teach their children and things like that so of course uh, a generational you know curse that's got to be broken is going to take a generation so I may not even see a lot of things that I, I want to see but my children will my grandchildren will and that's the biggest thing for me making sure that they have a, their own privilege that I created for them and also other children that I may father that are not my biological children um, because I also plan to adopt as well um uh when i turn 21 i'll be eligible to adopt and i plan on adopting children asap you know as soon as i turn 21 um i definitely feel like that's super important and i feel like um all black families it should adopt at least one child um and not go anywhere else and adopt a child we're not adopting children from india or australia no we're adopting black children <laughs> here in america that need you know the care um because a lot of my mom did foster care our whole life my whole life she did foster care 
and um, the children that we would have come in the home, you know, they'd be going through so much, you know, their whole lives, you know, and I feel like, why are we going out of the country and going here and there to go adopt children when we have children that's going through holy hell, you know, right here at home, let's adopt some of our own children, you know, that need the help. Um, so that's what I feel like. I feel like every black family, you know, should adopt at least one child, at least one, you know, but I want to adopt a whole lot of them, but <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, you know, I feel like that's a big step that we could take too. Um, but the vision, you know, like I said, it won't happen, um, for a while. You'll see the changes growing. You'll see the betterment of the community as time progresses. But as far as the, the big overall vision for Albany, well, my vision, uh, for Albany, it'll take time. It'll take time you know, but it's, it's better for the children to see and, you know, their children to see. What if you got an actual school building mm -hmm. and your um, program was a school? Like, I know Albany High closed down, so that's mm -hmm. vacant. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, that would be interesting. Well, for right now, um, there's this building I've been looking at um it's an old warehouse building but it has a lot of office space in the front as well and i went and looked at the building i went and looked on the inside of it and i've also you know taken pictures of it and things like that and it has a lot of room has a lot of classrooms well office rooms i can make classrooms and it also has two big warehouse spaces um in the back um and they have a lot of upstairs area as well for me to be able to, be able to do workshops they have garage door areas where i could you know pull cars in to be able to do uh different um workshops with the um you know cars and things like that welding driving a forklift all of those things so i think that particular building is the one i've been searching for is that's the one i want but i've been trying to contact the owner and it all of that kind of paused when COVID happened but I'm one of those people that I ask for anything because the worst somebody could tell you is no. And the building has been vacant for five years, um, but it's, it has a brand new roof on it and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm just simply going to propose to him, you know, what the building is going to be used for, um, the success rate, you know, the numbers, all of that stuff and what it could do for the city of Albany. And if you donate me this building, you know, um, I can make this look good for you, you know, so we can make this look good together. You know, you donate it. Yeah, I say help me help you out. So, but if not, you know, I'll try to raise enough money, you know, for that um, to happen. So, but that's that's the idea to get um, the boys a building and hopefully a school building and a school bus. You know, time time will tell with those things. So it's coming slowly but surely. Uh, I just stay patient and everything happens when it's time. Yeah, and even if I interview someone and you think they they might can help you, like. I will usually list the contact information on the YouTube video. So mm -hmm. gotcha. my resources are your resources. So. Same here. <laughs> you ever need anything, just let me know. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so what advice do you have for another young person around our age or older wanting to do something similar to what you're doing and get involved in their community? Um, I say the advice that I have is for one, search for the exact area that you feel needs the most attention. Um, because where I work, you know, a lot of people may not feel like this is the most important area, but for me it is. Um, so I feel like look for what's most important to you because every area needs help, you know, and no one person can do it all. Um, and so I feel like look for that area that is super important to you, you know, and go ahead and make it happen. Cause a lot of people are procrastinating and feel like they need to start off super big and all of those things like that. It didn't even have to start off big. You know, I, the first thing I ever did was a field trip with um, uh, 20 kids. Um, I, I made a little flyer and I was like, Hey, we're going to a museum up in Atlanta. Um, and, you know, call me if you want your child to go. And then the next thing I did was an oil change workshop and taught children how to change oil. So that's kind of that, <laughs> but I feel like those are the things that you could do to uh, help yourself. And um, <laughs> those are the things you can do to help the community. And that's the advice I have for you, so. Okay, that's good advice. But uh, how is your mental health? Um, I know this work, the work you do is a lot. Um, so how do you keep your mental strength up enough to take on these boys and their hardships and be a leader 
Um, well, for the most part, I definitely feel like um, they give me my mental um, energy and keep my mental capacity up because I'm I'm seeing the results and seeing the changes. And a lot of people will get um, discouraged mentally when they don't see what's happening. And I'm able to see the changes with my children every day. Now, sometimes when I get maybe a child that is ungrateful or really belligerent or just doesn't care to learn anything or you know i get those you know I'm, I'm not able to help every child you know for the most part but i will have few and far in between that just do not want to be here they do not want to learn anything they are strictly stuck on what they want to do um and so sometimes that'll discourage me because i'm just like well why don't you want to learn you know how to make money you know and how to do things you know the proper way um because usually those children like that are either super spoiled or they were in the streets before they came to me and they feel like you know selling drugs or things like that are faster ways to make money but i'm just like this is gonna lead you know somewhere bad you know and i don't want you to have to learn that lesson you know so i'm trying to teach you other things i know there are other things you probably want to do but those are the small things that will discourage me but end of the day i have to keep moving because there are still other children that do want to learn and do want to um you know move forward and learn different things so i keep my mental capacity up you know just working with them every day uh that's literally all i do is work with them um, and that's the most fun thing for me. Uh, it's actually fun. It's not like a job, you know, I actually enjoy doing it. Um, so it's not um, super, uh, you know, um, on me. But for the most part, sometimes I'll take me a little break, you know, I'll go play my video game or something like that. I go read a book or go outside in my garden or go play with my animals outside. Uh, but yeah, I'll take small breaks sometime. But it's never a big need because I feel like right now, if I work now, I can play later versus most people our age right now are trying to play now and then have to work later, you know, and I'd rather be playing when I'm 40 instead of working. So, cause You're my back ain't, <laughs> yeah, yeah, my back ain't going to be that good when I get that old. So <laughs> I'm not trying to be doing a whole lot of work when I turn 40 and 35. So I'm just trying to get all the work out of the way now and then go and play later. Plus I'm using my life as a sacrifice for, for my boys um, because a lot of them, um, you know, they are going to want to do certain things when they get a certain age. And I'm going to make sure that I have done, you know, all of those things that they don't have to do. I'm trying to make sure, you know, they don't have to do a lot of things. Like I don't want my son ever have to be paying people houses or, or cutting hair or welding or any of that stuff. I want him to have I want to have set up so many businesses and things for him that all he has to do is come and take the reins, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I sacrifice my life for the life of all of the other boys, you know, and teaching them all of these things. So when they turn 20 and 21 and 22, they, they'll have the, the money and things like that to go and play. I don't have that right now, but I want them to have that when they turn 20, 21 and 22. Yeah. Um, so I'm sacrificing my life for them. Um, to make sure that they are able to go and do the things that they want to do. Um, and it's, that's not saying I don't want to do this, but I feel like, you know, what I'm doing is way more important than, you know, me going on vacation or going to travel and things like that. I want them to be able to do that stuff, you know, when they're my age. I want them to be able to, you know, have their homes and, and go and do what they want to do because mm -hmm. I set them up to be able to do those things. So Yes. Tell the people, Akeet. <laughs> Tell the people. Build own something so mm -hmm. your future kids grandkids like you said will have something that right. don't have to start from the bottom like we mm -hmm. do <laughs> exactly i don't want them to start from the bottom i want them to start from the top i, I don't care what people say about that silver spoon you can have that silver spoon in your mouth son because i gave it to you mm -hmm. you know so absolutely mm -hmm. so what do you want the people to know any lasting comments or anything okay well everybody can follow me on social media um all of my social media handles are a new emerging king um that's twitter snapchat instagram um facebook you can find me at king lakeet randall but you can just type in king randall and you'll see my face pop up somewhere up there um so you can type in king randall there um and you can reach me um at my email at the x for boys at gmail.com that's if you're interested in your son joining the program or pers my personal email is emergingking at gmail.com. So everything is new emerging king. You'll find me somewhere. Um, my email is on all of my social media handles and my uh, my business telephone number. So you can reach me at 229-999-3246. 
And um, what I want you to know is you have the mental capacity, you have the ability to do whatever you want to do. Um, and for those of you who believe in the scriptures, you and Jesus have the same father and you and Jesus are capable of doing the same things. So that's how you're able to be super powerful. And that's all I have for you. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Absolutely. No problem. Oh my gosh, you guys. What a good conversation. Thank you again, Lakeith. Um, I think what you're doing is amazing for the community. And hello, the expert boys, if you're watching also. Um, as always, thank you so much for watching. And if you made it this far, comment down below a uh, purple heart. I love purple. So um, yeah, don't forget to share also and like comment subscribe Ugh. and if you hear that it is storming outside i apologize but anyway peace <laughs>